Hello and welcome to one of my most favorite topics to talk about, showing instead of telling. If you ever hung around me, you have heard me say stuff before like I truly feel that we as prose writers did not truly learn how to manipulate grammar in the English language until really about the 1980s. To me, writing has always been an evolutionary process. And yes, we've been writing stories for over 5,000 years, but we have not been writing in the same way. And if you're like me and you've read some of the classics, you know, those stories that were written 50, 100, 150, 300, 500, 1,000 years ago, you may have struggled reading them. And the reason is pretty simple. The writing style back then was very rigid, very telly. And it means that the read is not necessarily the most enjoyable. I mean, I speak all over the world and, you know, I usually speak to my people, to the geeks, to the fantasy people. And so I'll be in a large room filled with fantasy people that want to write fantasy, they read fantasy, and I will ask, I will say, how many of you in this room have started reading Lord of the Rings, but never finish it. Now you gotta understand, Lord of the Rings is the fantasy novel. It's, it's what made this genre. It is the cornerstone of the entire fantasy world. And yet, every time I ask that question, about half the people raise their hand that they started it, but never finished reading it. Why? How is it that, that half the people that are in the fantasy game haven't finished reading that book? And the answer is pretty simple. It's written the old style, the old way and how we used to write. It's very telly. It's very long-winded. It's not as engaging as it probably could be. And the reality is, is it, it really probably wouldn't sell today. And I know that sounds sacrilegious to say, but the reality is the publishing industry has changed. Readers have changed. And because of this, if you're going to break into this industry and have any success whatsoever, you're going to need to change. And so I do a lot of classes on how to be a more immersive writer. But this is really the first one. This is kind of the, the beginning steps. It was also one of the very first classes that I ever created over a decade ago and I created it for a very specific reason so I when I travel I used to tell people hey if you've got something that you want me to critique send me a page or two now I don't do that anymore I'm way too busy but back then I wasn't quite as busy as I am now and so people would send me stuff they would send me a sample of whatever my number one piece of advice was always you're too telly. You need to be more showy. So I would read something from somebody and I would make that comment. You're too telly. You need to be more showy. And they'd be like, oh, thank you so much. That's great advice. I need to be more showy. You are 100% right. And then they would run off and they would rewrite those couple of pages and they would send them back to me. And I would take a look at them and I would go, you know, I see that you're using different words than you used last time, but you're still very telly and you need to be more showy. And they would go, oh, you said that. I remember you said that. You said that before about my lesson. And, and now, okay, all right, great. I'll go. I, and, and I'm gone. And they would go and they would rewrite that. And they would send it back to me and I would reread it and I would go, you have no idea what I mean when I say be more showy, do you? And they're like, not a clue. I, I don't understand that at all. Because it's difficult. It's a difficult topic to wrap your mind around. It really isn't. It really comes down to thinking different is what it is. The English language is the English language, but there's a, a multitude of ways to use the English language to convey your story as a prose writer. And so really that's where we start. We start with thinking different about the English language, thinking different about how we're going to put words on paper, and we're going to change our mindset. And that's really the difference between being a telly writer and being a showy writer. So here's the class. Like I said, it's one of my favorites to give. There's a lot of information in it, but there's a lot of things that I won't be able to cover just in this video. So there'll be more videos following this up on how to be a more showy writer, how to be more immersive with your readers, get them engaged more in your story and your characters and your conflict and your plot. So really just kind of think of this as that first step to becoming a more immersive writer. As I want to do, I start my classes with a quote. This one is from Anton Chekhov. Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. And I love this quote because we're talking about being a more showy writer and less of a telly writer, and it literally has the word tell and show right in it. But that's not the reason why I use this quote and have been using this quote for over a decade. The biggest reason why I use this quote is old Anton died over a hundred years ago. Since the dawn of time, readers have been bitching at writers to stop telling in their writing. I've got this 
image in my head of two cavemen sitting around a campfire one day and one caveman going, hmm, I like your story about saber tooth attack, but you, you very telly, you should be more showy. It's a big problem with writers, but why is it a big problem? Well, it's because we don't talk in a showy manner. We talk in a telly manner, which is why if you followed me long enough, you've heard me say many, many, many times, you cannot write prose the way you talk because we talk different. It's a different form of communication than prose. Prose has its own rules and regulations and limitations and advantages that speech doesn't have. So if you write the way you talk, you write poorly. It's that simple. Again, as I said earlier, to become a more showy writer, you're going to have to change the way you think about communicating with your readers. But the big question is, what does showing even mean? For me, showing is all about immersion. And I'm talking about the immersion of the reader here, the immersion of them inside the story, becoming the characters, feeling all the things that you want them to feel within that story. Because that's what separates prose from everything else is the ability for the reader to become the characters. Sure, Brad Pitt could act on stage or on screen and he could cry and suffer or whatever, but you as the viewer never become Brad Pitt. Prose writing, novel writing, is the only thing where the reader can absolutely become that character and feel that agony with that character. It is what separates prose from all other entertainment mediums. But if you don't do it right, you're never going to succeed in that. So what I mean by that is speculative fiction should forge an emotional bond between the reader and what is being read. A great story can operate at a high intellectual level, but without drawing the reader in with something that speaks to them on a visceral level, the reader won't be moved by the greater ideas behind the story. And yes, I'm talking about the theme here. Now, I'm going to do a plethora of videos on theme. There's a lot to talk about, but it boils down to this. If you don't have a theme for your story, you don't have a story. You have a bunch of words that you puked on paper that you should never let anyone read ever, including your mom. Yeah, I feel that strongly about theme, which is a shame because most aspiring writers don't even know the definition of the word theme. And that's bad. But again, that is a topic for a completely other series of videos. For now, let's really focus in on what I mean by telling and showing. So, the word tell is a verb. It means to give an account or narrative of, to narrate, or to relate. Now, my definition of this is pretty simple. This is like watching an animal documentary. We've all done that before. You're watching TV and there's a cheetah and she's, you know, kind of prowling around the prairie and she's looking at this gazelle and she's getting ready to pounce. But you, the viewer, have no idea what that cheetah is thinking. That cheetah is not going to act anything out for you. They're not going to convey their emotions, their thoughts, their feelings. So what you need is you need a narrator. You need this guy that's going to be off screen that's going to be like, the cheetah is very hungry. She hasn't eaten in a week. If she doesn't make this kill, she won't be able to produce enough milk for her babies and they will die. Now, you, the viewer, get to understand kind of what this cheetah is doing, what they're thinking, why they're doing what they're doing as you watch them chase down and brutally murder this little innocent gazelle. But you had to be told that. And so that's what I mean by telling. It's when a narrator is telling the viewer what's going on. Now, show is also a verb. It means to cause or allow to be seen. So continuing with my earlier example, this is like watching a movie where the actor, let's say Brad Pitt is in a movie and we're watching him and it's, it's him and his son and they're out in the city and they're having this wonderful dad-son day and they're really, really getting to know each other and having a lot of fun and they're going to museums and they've gone to the movies and they've done all this really fun stuff and they're really, really bonding and you, the audience, get to see that, that father-son love between them and they're walking down the street and all of a sudden the son trips and falls into the street and a bus runs him over. And I, and I mean runs, like his head literally pops. So there's no way the kid's going to survive this. It's not like he broke his leg or something. He's dead. And so Brad Pitt rushes out in the street and he, he scoops up the remains of his child and he's just crying and screaming. If you saw the movie Seven, imagine his portrayal at the end of that movie right here. So like he is just blubbering his eyes out. Well, we don't need some dude to step in frame from the side and go, uh, just in case you were wondering, this guy... He's very sad that his child is dead. We don't need that because Brad Pitt is going to show us the pain that he's feeling. Now, the problem with my examples is I'm cheating. Those are movies. 
and we're prose writers. All we get is words, but that's the rub. That's the hard part of what we do as prose writers. Using only words, we have to accomplish the same thing as the second part of that. We have to accomplish the Brad Pitt and showing those emotions and avoid the stupid guy who's telling us what the cheetah is doing. And believe me, that's very, very hard. Or it's not. I mean, it takes practice, time and effort, as I always say. I think the hard part about it is, is changing your mentality, changing the way you think so that you think about it in a different way. Because again, we're not talking prose, we're writing prose. But when it comes to prose, that really is the difference between showing and telling. The basic difference between telling and showing is that with telling, the writer is merely cataloging actions, feelings, emotions, and events. That is literally the smartest thing I've ever written in my entire life. So I'm gonna say that twice. The basic difference between telling and showing is that with telling, the writer is merely cataloging actions, feelings, emotions, and events. Showing paints an image that allows the reader's imagination to create the scene and place the reader in the middle of it. And that is a huge distinction between the two. Unfortunately, most aspiring writers and some not aspiring writers all they do is tell and they never show and it's because they write the way they speak. So how do we fix that? Well, let's look at 11 thinking points that will help us become more immersive, more showy writers and less of a telly writer. Thinking point one, use stronger verbs. Now I will warn you, this step actually has nothing to do with being a more showy writer and less of a telly writer. However, this step is literally the foundation for being a showy writer. But as you'll see in a second, you can use stronger verbs and still absolutely be a telly writer. But this topic is important. This is something you really, really need to buy into because as a prose writer, the number one tool of every sentence, the strongest point, the structure of that sentence is the verb. And most aspiring writers just don't get that. They don't understand that the entire sentences are built around your verb. So they use weaker verbs, which in turn create weaker sentences, which in turn create weaker stories. So your verbs are the most important part of your sentence, and you really need to spend time thinking about them. And the beautiful thing about being a prose writer in the English language is our language has been made up from stealing from every other language on the planet. And that is wonderful. And the reason why we have so many different choices that all do the same thing. Many other languages do not have that flexibility or power. So here's what I mean. We could write the sentence, Drake hit the wall. You can see that, right? You can see Drake, you can see him hit the wall. Pretty simple little thing. However, change the verb. Drake struck the wall. Do you see the same scene? Are the same motions going on in your imagination? More than likely not. More than likely, the angle of the arm completely changed. In my head, it does. If I say he hit something, then usually it's a, it's a hit. But if it's struck, it usually is like maybe like something like that or something like, you know, different. It just, it's a different image in my imagination. But what if we write, Drake whacked the wall? That's also different in my imagination. The sentence has changed yet again. Drake bashed the wall. One more time, we're different. And that's the power of English grammar. We have all of these words, they all mean the same thing. It is literally Drake punching a wall. But each one of these is gonna evoke a different image within the reader's mind. They're gonna see something different on each one of these. And that's an amazing thing for a prose writer because we have the ability to really hone in on what we want that reader to experience in their imagination as they're reading our work. Now, there is a caution to this. We as prose writers are not the sources. Your job as a prose writer is not to prove that you are smarter than the reader because the only thing that will prove is that the reader doesn't have to give you any money. So if you wrote the line, Drake percussed the wall, while technically this is correct, if I read this in your manuscript, we're done. I'm no longer reading you ever again because Drake percussed the wall is a stupid sentence. So use stronger verbs, but don't go insane. Don't just pull out the thesaurus and, you know, go nuts. That's not your job as a writer. Your job as a writer is to convey things to the reader, to paint images upon their imagination. So yes, we want to pay attention to our verbs, but we don't want to go insane with them. Because verbs really are the way to your reader's heart. And the more time you spend thinking about the perfect verb for every single one of your sentences, the more your reader's going to enjoy the read. 
Let's look at one more example before we move off of this topic. Drake put his gun in his holster, turned, and walked from the room. Again, simple sentence. You can see Drake, you can see the gun, you can see him put it in his holster, you can see him turn and walk out of the room. Not that hard to imagine within your reader brain. However, let's just look at the verbs. Let's just change the two verbs and see what happens to the sentence. Drake slammed his gun in his holster, turned and stormed from the room. Do you see the same scene? Of course not. And yet, we only changed two words. Two small little words are the only difference between these two sentences, and yet they evoke completely different reactions from the reader. They paint completely different images within the reader's imagination. And that's the power of verbs. If we're going to change the way we write, we have to change the way we think about verbs and understand that they are absolutely the most important word in every sentence that we write. And again, that won't make you a more showy writer understanding that, but it is absolutely the foundation that you need to build upon and one of the most important concepts to wrap your mind around as a prose writer. Thinking point two, let the reader feel it. Don't tell the reader what to feel. Emotions are the fertile ground in which to sow the show. Unfortunately, it's easy to slip into telling. Emotions are the way to the reader's heart. If you can immerse the reader into what your narrator is experiencing, your job as a writer is more than half done. And this is where things are gonna start getting heavier. We're going to start talking more about theory and understanding what our job is as a prose writer and how are we going to convey this information. And emotions is kind of the key to being a good immersive writer. You know, one of the biggest epiphanies that I had as a professional prose writer was understanding one simple little topic. It was when I realized that as a prose writer, I'm not writing about things. I'm not writing about what the room looks like, what the characters look like, what they're doing, so on and so forth. I mean, I absolutely am. Every one of those things has to be in the prose words. They just have to be. But that's not what makes good prose. The epiphany I came up on was... I'm writing human emotion. And again, this is why you can't write prose the way we talk, because we don't talk in human emotion. We talk giving information, what things look like, what we're doing, so on and so forth. But that's not what makes good prose. What makes good prose is understanding that we are literally conveying human emotions. And emotions are scary, and a lot of people don't like to go there, which is why a lot of people aren't good writers. But if you're going to immerse the reader into what they're reading, you're going to have to go there. So let's take a look at those. We don't want to tell our readers what the characters in our story are feeling. We want to show it to them. Let them experience those emotions for themselves. Again, going back to my original example, we don't want to be the voiceover narrator that's telling our readers what the cheetah is feeling. We want to allow that Brad Pitt actor that's on page to show it to those readers, to allow them to experience it along with them. And it actually isn't as difficult as it sounds. It's just a change in your mentality, a change in your philosophy so that you understand what you're supposed to be doing as a prose writer. To that end, Let's look at some examples so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. The monster jumped from the bushes and Drake was scared. Now I've read this type of writing a billion times. And let's break this down. The, the white part of that, let's not worry about it. It's not the best written, but it's just an example. It's just here for me to show you what I'm talking about. So ignore the white part. And let's just focus in on that yellow part. Now, going back to thinking point one about using stronger verbs. So scared in this sentence is a weak verb. Now, scared may work well as a verb in other sentences, but when a monster jumps out at you, the word scared is a weak reaction. So let's replace that. Let's begin there. The monster jumped from the bushes and Drake was terrified. Terrified is a much stronger verb. It paints a, the, the image that we're trying to convey to our reader because terror is much more dramatic than scared. However, there's a second verb in that little section of yellow. The word was. In this instance, it's a linking verb. It is linking the noun Drake to the verb terrified and was is a weak verb. So we can fix that as well by changing it to Drake felt terrified. And yes, while this does improve the sentence, it is still 100% a tell. We are telling the reader how Drake feels. Drake, by the way, Mr. Reader, he felt 
terrified. I like to explain it like this. If you can turn it into a math equation, you're telling. In other words, Drake equals terrified. That's a math equation. We don't do math. We're prose writers. We write grammar. So if you can turn it into a math equation, you're telling. It's that simple. But how do we fix that? How do we change it to where we're showing what Drake is feeling as opposed to telling the reader what he's feeling? Well, this is where we change our mindset. This is where we start to dig deeper and understand that we have to show these emotions and not tell them. And it's actually pretty simple. All we need to do is ask ourselves, hmm, self, what does it look like to feel terrified? Whatever your answer is, that's what you write. Pretty simple. So as an example, we could write, the monster jumped from the bushes, terror washed over Drake, draining the blood from his face. Now we're showing the reader that Drake is terrified. Now, to me, this is overwriting, and there's a bunch of words in here that we just absolutely don't need. So to clean this up, we could instead write, the monster jumped from the bushes, the blood drained from Drake's face. Because everyone understands what it means when the blood drains from your face. It means that you're scared, you're terrified, whatever. But that's just one example of just literally a plethora of answers of what does terror look like. And this is not a class on the specifics of how to write emotions. This is a class on understanding that you need to show as opposed to tell. But let's go down the terror aspect. Let's just look at some examples really quickly. So if we were describing terror, we could write, I struggle to breathe if I was in first person or Drake struggled to breathe if he was my third person narrator. Maybe in first person we might write, my eyes bulged. Third person, Drake's eyes bulged. Tremors racked my body. Tremors racked Drake's body. The sensation of needles ran up my spine. Drake's throat clamped shut. A scream ripped from my lips. Drake's palm felt clammy. And while I have this example in there, do know that I hate that example. And you'll understand why as we get deeper into this. But it's still better than Drake was terrified. I backed away. Escape being the only thought in my head. And on and on and on. We could go on forever, but we just don't have time. But my point here is to let you understand that there's lots of ways to describe everything. I don't care what it is, there's a million ways to describe what something looks like when it comes to emotions. Now, as a side note, do understand that when you are describing emotions, you do have to pay attention to whether you are describing the emotions of the narrating character or a secondary character. So in all of my examples above, I used a first person example and a third person example, but the narrator was always the one giving those emotions, no matter which POV I was writing it in. But keep in mind, you are more limited when you are in a secondary character's perspective because everything still has to come from that narrator. In other words, I could write the line, bile rose in the back of my throat, if I'm a first person narrator, or bile rose in the back of Drake's throat, if he's a third person narrator. But I couldn't write the line, bile rose in the back of John's throat if he's a secondary character unless my narrator walks over and sticks his tongue down that character's throat and tastes the bile down there. Because we're not in John's head. We're in Drake's head in this third person example or my head in this first person example. And John is a third party character, a secondary character as you were. So when it comes to showing the emotions of secondary characters, you are more limited into what the narrating character could visually see or could, you know, it, with using his other senses, kind of pick up on. So be careful with that. You do need to pay attention to whether you're showing the narrator doing something versus any of the other characters within your story. But really, in the end, it comes down to avoiding using bland linking verbs. So things like was, were, has, had, are, is, feel, felt. And that last one is the reason why I hated that one example so much. These are words that if you use them, you're usually telling. Not always. There's examples where you can use these and you're not telling. But these are huge red flags within your writing that you need to avoid if at all possible. As an example, we might write, the monster was coming toward me and I felt terrified. I had but one chance, the cliff though I knew I was not fast enough. There was simply too much ground between me and safety. Now, you may be reading this along with me and going, well, I don't really see anything wrong with that. It seems exciting. It seems immersive. It's not. It really sucks. It's terrible. So how do we fix it? Well, again, we ask ourselves, what does this stuff look like? How am I going to show that to the reader? And as always, there's a million ways to do it. Here's one example. I'm not saying it's the best example, but here's one example of what we might do to fix it. 
The monster stepped closer. My entire body shook, and I could not breathe. My mind raced as my eyes darted around. There! The cliff! A sliver of hope I could grasp. But could I outrun this nightmare? Same thing. Exact same thing in both of these pieces. About the same word count as well. However, the second one, I'm showing the reader what's going on, as opposed to the first one where I'm just listing off you know, again, cataloging actions, feelings, emotions, and events. We want to stay away from listing things off for the reader. We want them to be immersed in the read and to really enjoy what they're being reading and to be immersed by it, to become that character. They want to feel that as a reader. They, that's why they're reading our books is to become those characters and feel what they're feeling. And if you're telling, you're never going to do that for them. They're always just going to feel like, Somebody else is just telling them what's going on, but they're not really a part of it. Whereas once you start understanding how to be a showy writer, you force your reader to become those characters. And then it increases their enjoyment of that read exponentially. Hey everyone, Drake here. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you got something out of this little tutorial of mine. If you'd like to continue learning uh, from me and, and how I see writing and everything else, this video that you just watched is just a small piece of my Better Writing Through Stronger Narrative book. You can also check out my book, Dynamic Story Creation in Plain English. I've heard that both are really, really good. You can find them both at Amazon.com or on my website, DrakeU.com. If you'd like to check out what I've been working on during this crazy time, you can head on over to fiendfolly.com and check out some stuff, some artwork that I've done on a new cartoon that I'm working on. There's some videos up as well. So hopefully you'll go over to fiendfolly.com and check that out and stay safe. Thank you. Thinking point three, avoid filtering. Filtering is the worst thing you can do to your story, and it rots it silently from the inside. Most aspiring writers have never even heard of this term, but it is the number one thing that kills most stories, in my opinion. Now, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on filtering in this class because I've already done a 30-minute video that just talks about filtering specifically. So when you're done with this, go watch that and you'll get all of the information. However, let's look at the highlights so that you can understand it as we move forward through this video. So we definitely want to avoid filtering. And this is going to really get into the more grammar aspects of prose writing, but filtering has to do with what you, the writer, want the reader to focus on. And that comes down to understanding why we construct our sentences the way we do. So as an example, I could feel the demon's hot breath licking the back of my neck. Now to understand this, we're going to have to go back to third grade. For me, it was Miss Johnson's class. and She hated me because I was terrible at English back then. But we're going to have to go back to the third grade because we're going to have to diagram this sentence. So the subject of the sentence is I. I am the subject. And the action of this sentence is could feel. So the subject becomes the focal point for our readers. But is that the important part of the sentence? Do we want the readers to focus on I and the fact that I'm feeling something? Or is the demon's hot breath way more interesting for the reader when it comes to this specific sentence? To me, it's the demon's hot breath, not me. So instead, I would write this sentence, the demon's hot breath licked the back of my neck. Because again, diagramming the sentence, now we see that the demon's hot breath is the subject. And the action is licked. And that's way more immersive and terrifying for the reader to read than the first sentence. We don't need the reader focusing on I. And that's really where this term comes from. We call it filtering because what you're doing is you are filtering the story through the narrator. You're forcing the reader to watch the narrator watch the story. So you're filtering it through that narrator. So in the first example, I could feel. So the reader is looking at the narrator and the narrator is feeling something. So reader looking at narrator, narrator experiencing the story. 
reader being filtered through the narrator. In the second version, the demon's hot breath is licking the back of my neck. So now the reader is focusing on the demon's hot breath. The reader is experiencing the demon's hot breath and what it's doing. So they're not being filtered through that narrator. They're literally just being immersed by what they're reading and experiencing what they're reading firsthand as opposed to being filtered through that narrator. So that's why it's called filtering. And that's what we want to avoid. And there's a lot to this. Again, it's the reason why I made an entire video all by itself just on this one topic. And I'm not going to read this entire list, but as you can see, it has a lot to do with the senses. It has to do with sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile feel, and then the emotional feel. Anytime you find yourself writing, I did one of these words, the you know, Drake did one of these words, if you're in third person, then you're filtering. You're forcing the reader to concentrate on the narrator and then, and then watch that narrator experience whatever it is you're trying to get them to experience. And we want to cut that out. We don't want to do that. So we don't want to write something like Drake wondered what it would feel like to fall to his death. Because again, the subject is Drake. The action is wondered. We're filtering that story through Drake. But we don't want that. We want the reader to understand what it feels like to wonder what it would feel like to fall to your death. And again, it's a, a mental change in how we're going to perceive things. We're going to ask the question, hmm, what does it look like to wonder how it would feel to fall to your death? And as an example, we might write, Drake's imagination ran wild, the wind rushing past him, whipping his clothes into a tangled frenzy, the sight of the ground racing up to meet him, its sole desire to crush every bone in his body, the terror and ecstasy of his last few breaths of life. Then the reader can go, oh, that's what it feels like to wonder what it would be like to fall to your death. Bonus, Drake is batshit crazy. And if that's the type of character that we're trying to portray to the reader, then by expanding upon this wondering what it would feel like to fall to his death, we are expanding upon the understanding the reader is going to gain into this character's mindset. And showing does all this stuff. It, it really does enrich the story in so many different ways that just telling will never accomplish. So to beat this like a rented mule, let's look at a few more examples before we move on. I watched as the ghost floated down the hall toward me. So the reader is watching I as I am doing something. It's being filtered through it. No, don't want to do that. The ghost floated down the hall toward me. That's what we want to experience for the reader. Drake looked at the policeman who had his gun pointed at him. Again, reader looks at Drake while Drake looks at something else. The policeman had his gun pointed at Drake. I heard the monster's claws ripping up the ground as it gave chase. Reader, look at me as I listen to something. The monster's claws ripped up the ground as it gave chase. Drake could feel the knife slice into his arm. The knife sliced into Drake's arm. And then you have to show what that feels like. But my point is, one of the things that you should notice as we're going through here, a lot of times I just need to drop the filtering and the sentence still works. So look at that very first example. I watch as the ghost floated down the hall toward me. If we just cut those first three words, the sentence is still a complete sentence and it's no longer filtering. The ghost floated down the hall toward me. You'd be amazed at how many of your filterings can be fixed literally by just lopping off the filtering. Not all of them can be fixed that way and some of them do need to be reworked and you'll see that as you're going through it. But the reality is, you know, 72% of all statistics are made up on the spot. So let's say 86% of all filtering sentences, you can just lop the filtering right off and you no longer have to worry about it. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to adjust anything. It just reads perfectly. Your mileage may vary, but the point is filtering is bad. But you're not going to cut filtering out all the time. Sometimes you want to use filtering. Remember what I said at the beginning of this. I didn't say cut out all your filtering. I said filtering is understanding that we're going to construct our sentences in a manner that force our readers to focus on what we want them to focus on. So in a past example, we don't want the reader to focus on I felt. We want the readers to focus on the demon's hot breath licked because that's more immersive and more enjoyable for the reader. But sometimes we absolutely want the reader to look at the narrator. So we want to filter the story through it because the narrator is the important part of the sentence. So as an example, I'm sorry, Drake, but we can't be together any longer. Dylan said as he stood, I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. I watched as Dylan slowly walked away, my heart aching. What's the important part of that second sentence? 
Is the important part Dylan walking away? No, not at all. Dylan is an aspect of that scene and Dylan has just dumped Drake and Dylan is leaving. Yes, we have to describe that. But what do we want the reader focusing in on? Do we want her to focus in on Dylan walking away? No. We want them to focus in on Drake who's sitting there stunned and aching and in pain. He is the focal point of that sentence. So that's what we do. We filter the story through Drake because we want the reader to watch Drake as Drake watches Dylan walk away. Because that's where the story's at. The story is in Drake watching this guy walk away from him. Not in the fact that Dylan is leaving. So filtering is not bad all the time. But as I always say, time and effort. I only filter when I specifically want my reader to focus in on the narrator. If I do not want the reader to focus in on the narrator, I absolutely do not filter. I make sure I write every single sentence in a manner that allows the reader just to experience what's going on, which means most of my sentences are written without filtering. 98%, I don't know. It's a fictitious number. But the reality is, is almost every single sentence is going to be written without filtering. And I only filter when I need the reader to seriously focus in on that character. That's when I'm going to filter. And again, there's an entire video on filtering. So go watch that when you're done with this one and you'll be able to see a bunch more examples, a bunch more options on how to fix them and so on and so forth. You'll see a lot of the repeat because I do use the same stuff. I can only come up with so many examples, but there's a whole bunch of new stuff in that one video. Continuing on in Mrs. Johnson's third grade English class, let's look at thinking point four. Write active voice, not passive voice. Now, this is another one of those grammar things, and it can be a tricky topic to master, but really it's not a tricky topic to understand. So here is the English grammar definition of active voice versus passive voice. And as you can see, it's very easy to understand. In an active voice sentence, the subject is doing the action. In a passive voice sentence, the target of the action gets promoted to the subject position. Like it doesn't get more plain Jane blue collar simple than that, right? Yeah, this is the reason why I hate academia and the reason why I hate the way English grammar is described. But it really is not that complicated. It really is simple. So let's stay in third grade and let's diagram a very simple sentence. The dog bit the boy. It doesn't get more simple than that. If we diagram this sentence, we see that the subject is the dog. The action is bit and the boy is the recipient of that action. It's written in active voice because the subject, the dog, is doing the action, bit, active. Subject is actively doing the action. Very simple. Now, if we were to write this in passive voice, we're going to flip things around. And instead, we're going to write, the boy was bitten by the dog. So again, diagramming the sentence, we see that the boy is the subject, was bitten is now the action, and the person perpetrating this, or the entity perpetrating this, is the dog. But what is the subject? The boy. What did he do? Nothing. He didn't do anything. He received the action, but he didn't do the action. Therefore, it's passive voice. Whenever your subject is not doing the action, you're writing in passive voice. And we absolutely don't want to do this again unless there's a specific reason for it. Now, the statistics in prose writing, if you're an American prose writer, you're supposed to write less than 2% of your entire manuscript in passive voice. If you're a British prose writer, they are a very passive culture. I have no idea how they took over the world at one point, but they're very passive people. And in their prose writing, you can write up to 20% passive voice, which is crazy to me because passive voice tends to be a more telly writing style. <coughs> Lord of the Rings. <coughs> anyway, sorry. Had some cut my throat there. For me, I write probably less than 0.2% passive voice. I write almost no passive voice. But why write passive voice at all? Well, the beautiful thing about writing in passive voice is you can actually lose the noun that is doing the action and still write a, a complete sentence. So in other words, we could write the sentence, the boy was bitten. That's a complete sentence. But who bit the boy? Was it a dog? Was it a spider? Was it his sister? We don't know because the information's not there. So I do write passive voice sentences, but only in an instance where I do not want to give the reader a piece of information. If I'm withholding 
the actual perpetrator of whatever the action is of the sentence from the reader, I will write it in passive voice because that's the only way I can do it. But I would never write the boy was bitten by the dog because all the information is there. It's all there for the reader. We have the boy, we have the action, we have the perpetrator. I would never write that in passive voice because it's absolutely a waste. It's not an active form of writer. It's so much stronger to write the dog bit the boy because it's active voice as opposed to the passive voice. But again, the boy wakes up and he was bitten and I don't want the reader to know who bit him, what bit him, whatever. That's when I'm going to flip it around and I'm going to write that last example. The boy was bitten. And then the boy nor the reader know who did the biting. And again, that's on purpose. Effort, time. These are the things that I put into my prose that makes my readers enjoy what I write. Thinking point five, don't tell the reader how to react. An easy way to grasp if you're telling instead of showing is by looking at the words you are using. Do the words tell the reader how they should react? If they do, you're telling. As an example, then in a totally unexpected move, the monster jumped at Drake. So what we're doing here is we are expecting the reader to understand what an unexpected move is. Basically, every time I read something like this, I always read it in my head this way. I go, then in a, I'm a really crappy writer and don't know how to show this, so you, the reader, do my job for me and just understand that it's an unexpected move, the monster jumped at Drake. Yeah, it's a much more wordy way of, of reading than, than what might actually be written, but that's literally the way I read this stuff every time I come across it in somebody else's story. It's just crap. It's a terrible way to write. You're expecting the reader to do your job for you, but you're a prose writer. You're supposed to be painting the scene for them. You're just supposed to show it instead of telling it. One example of how we might fix this? Drake took another step back, and again the monster did not move. Letting out a shuddered breath, he forced himself to calm down. I just need to keep moving away and I'll be fine, he thought. Shock stabbed into him as the creature lunged, claws bared. Now I'm showing an unexpected move, as opposed to just expecting the reader to do my job for me. So we don't want to tell the reader how to react, which means we want to avoid words like unexpectedly, suddenly, abruptly, out of the blue, without warning, surprisingly, all at once, and the list goes on and on and on. These are huge red flags that you're telling, and I highly recommend that you search them out in Word to see if you're actually using them. And then ask yourself the question, what does it look like to have the monster do an unexpected move? And then that's your answer. You write that. Again, it's about changing the way we're thinking as storytellers, changing the way we're giving information to the readers. Thinking point six, let the reader see it, don't make them guess. Showing is also about eliminating ambiguity and vagueness within your narrative. A writer needs to paint a picture. I said at the beginning of this, it's not necessarily about understanding that we're writing things because you do have to write those things, but it's about writing human emotion. And that's awesome and wonderful, but we still have to describe the things too. And a lot of that can get very telly if you're not paying attention. If you assume the reader knows what you mean, you make an ass out of you and me as the old saying goes. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to assume anything. So case in point, we could write the line, there was an old shack sitting in the backyard. But there's a lot of ambiguity and vagueness to that. What does the old shack look like? I mean, all of us have seen an old shack sitting in a backyard at some point during our life. But do you think you see the same shack as me? No, absolutely not. You're from a different part of the country, different part of the world. Your shacks may be built out of different things. I mean, I live in an area that doesn't have backyards. We have rocks. I mean, I live in the desert. I live in Las Vegas. We don't have green grass. But I grew up on the East Coast, you know, in an area that does have tons and tons of grass. And I promise you the shacks here look way different from the shacks on the East Coast. So what do we do? Well, we've got to eliminate that vagueness. We've got to eliminate that ambiguity. We've got to go into more depth. So as an example, we might write, an old shack slumped in the backyard like a broken weed, its pale white paint faded and flaking. The door hung limp on its hinges, swinging in the gentle breeze. Now you're starting to see the shack that I'm starting to see because I'm painting a better picture for you. So when it comes to your narrative, you need to do that. Now here's some tricks to this. You may have noticed as we've been going through some of these examples that the telly version is usually less word count than the showy version. And that's usually the way it works. Normally when you show in your writing, you're going to add word count. And that's important because as a prose writer, you are limited. 
we've got a lot of flexibility and have the ability to, to write words. No one's going to say you have to write 22,817 words exactly. That's not the way this industry works, but you are still limited. Depending on your genre, you may be limited to 60,000 word novels. You may be limited to 80,000 word novels, 110,000 word novels. If you're writing short form prose, you may be limited to 3,000 words, 5,000, 12,000, whatever. So if you're going to be a showy writer, you're going to use more words showing things as opposed to telling them. But here's my opinion on that. I would rather go over budget on my word count and deliver a very immersive, very showy, very dynamic story as opposed to meeting my word count and delivering a telly piece of crap. So I don't get hung up on word counts. It's They are what they are and I write as much as I need to write to convey the topic to the reader. But I am choosy in the words that I use. They are still real estate to me. They're valuable to me. It's currency. So I'm not going to waste that currency. So going back to my last example, let's say we're writing a story where our main character Drake is walking into this haunted house and he's going to go upstairs and he's going to find this magic mirror. And once he activates that magic mirror, he's going to be teleported away to a completely different world. And he is never, ever coming back to this world. He's never coming back to this haunted house. This house is gone as far as the story is concerned. Well, I'm not going to waste words describing a shack in the backyard that we never see. I may not even write it. Why would I write it? Well, so as a fantasy writer, one of the things that I know that I need to do is I always need to ground my reader in the mundane. I mean, I'm walking into a normal house, but I'm going to find a magic mirror that teleports us to another world. Well, I need to make sure that I'm constantly grounding my reader in the mundane before I take them in this fantastical journey. So I might have him look out a window as he's walking up the stairs. There might be a window in the stairs and he looks out and there's a backyard and he sees an old shack in the backyard. And the reason why I would do that is, is because it grounds the reader in the mundane. They go, oh, I've seen an old shack in the backyard. I must be just like this guy. And that's fine. But what I won't do is describe it much. Why? Because I don't care what the reader sees. I don't care if the reader sees a pink shack with strobe lights and naked dancing babies on the top. Like it doesn't matter to me because we're going to hit this magic mirror and we're going to leave. So I'm just going to write, he looked out the window and saw an old shack sitting in the backyard. And I'm going to let the reader decide what that old shack looks like. I don't care. It doesn't affect the story. However, if it does affect the story, that's when I'm going to care. Let's say we go upstairs, we root around in the upstairs for a little bit, and he actually finds a clue that leads him to the backyard and into that old shack. Well, now that becomes important to me because the shack becomes important to me future, you know, in the future of this story. So I'm going to have Drake look out that window and see that old shack, and I'm going to start describing it. Now, here's another trick that I like to use. Anytime I can divide up my narration, it is more interesting for the reader. So what I mean by that is, let's say there's two paragraphs that I'm going to use to describe this old shack. Well, if I give both paragraphs to the reader at one time, that can be tedious to kind of slog to, especially in this case where we're walking up a, a stairs and we're looking out a window at the backyard and the important thing is upstairs and the reader knows this. They're expecting what's going to be discovered upstairs. And so that old shack is kind of a distraction at this point. Well, what I'll do is I'll break that two paragraphs up. I'll give them a paragraph here. So that's when I might use the an old shack slumped in the backyard like a broken weed line. And that gives them a little bit of what that shack looks like. And then we're going to go upstairs. We're going to do whatever it is. We're going to discover that that old shack is very important. And then we're going to come downstairs, maybe in the next scene, the next chapter, whatever. And now we're going to go out there and the reader already has a little bit of what this shack looks like. And now I can just give them that second paragraph later, you know, at that time now that continues to flesh out that old shack. But what that does for me as a prose writer is it allows me to divide up that narrative into two different locations so that the reader doesn't have to slog through all of it at one time. Again, it's just a little trick that I like to use that kind of helps the reader not be bogged down by an information dump. It allows them to experience a little bit of it here, and then a chapter later they'll get the rest of it or another little piece of it there. And it's just very important to me, especially as an epic fantasy writer. As an epic fantasy writer, a lot of what I do is world building, which means I'm creating everything. I'm creating race, social standings, religion, what things look like, magic, economy, physics, the whole nine yards. And so I don't want to start off an epic fantasy book with five chapters of me just telling the reader how things work. 
So as an epic fantasy writer, you get really good at understanding that we have to break this stuff up and give them in, in small dollops here and a dollop there and a dollop here so that as the reader goes through it, they're not overwhelmed by this massive amount of information dump and learning this world that doesn't exist. It's an entirely new world that I'm going to have to explain everything, but I'm going to look for ways to break it up so that it is much more palatable for my reader to consume as they're traversing the story. So again, little side note, but little tidbit for you to help you in your own writing. Hey everyone, Drake here. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you got something out of this little tutorial of mine. If you'd like to continue learning uh, from me and, and how I see writing and everything else, this video that you just watched is just a small piece of my Better Writing Through Stronger Narrative book. You can also check out my book, Dynamic Story Creation in Plain English. I've heard that both are really, really good. You can find them both at Amazon.com or on my website, DrakeU.com. If you'd like to check out what I've been working on during this crazy time, you can head on over to fiendfolly.com and check out some stuff, some artwork that I've done on a new cartoon that I'm working on. There's some videos up as well. So hopefully you'll go over to fiendfolly.com and check that out and stay safe. Thank you. Getting back on track to being a more showy writer, thinking point seven, make it personal. And I swear to you, this is gonna be the hardest thing for you to grasp as we go through this. And I am going to make a video on just this topic. I just haven't done it as of yet, but it is on my list to create. But what I mean by this is one of the hardest concepts to grasp about being a showy writer is that you must make everything in your narrative personal to your narrator, your POV character. Remember, if you are writing in first person or third person limited POV, the two most common forms of narrative in speculative fiction, then it is your character who is telling the story, not you. And a lot of people forget that. A lot of people, a lot of aspiring writers think that, well, I'm writing the story, so obviously I'm telling the story. No, you're not. If you're in first person, it's that first person narrator, that first person POV who's telling that story, not you. You're just writing the words on paper. Same thing in Third Person Limited. If you're writing about Drake in Third Person Limited, then it's Drake who's telling the story and not you. So one of the things that you have to understand is that we have to get to the point where we make everything personal. And this is this becomes very theoretical and a lot harder for me to, to discuss and kind of show you. Again, that's the reason why I'm going to make an entire video on just this one topic. But let's look at a couple things. First of all, I think we should start with exposition. I don't know why, but I have visited writers groups uh, and writers conferences, and I've heard this over the last, especially over the last five or six years, where people will say, oh, exposition, you can't use it. Exposition is always tell. And that's insane. And what I mean by that is a lot of aspiring writers and not so aspiring writers feel that if a camera can't see it, you can't write it. And the reason why this is an absolute insane thing to say is that exposition is what separates pros from all other forms of entertainment. I write comic scripts, I write movie scripts, and when you're writing a script, that fact is 100% true. You cannot write exposition in a movie script because it's a different medium. You're only writing what is factual, what is said, and so on and so forth, because then the cast and crew of that movie are going to expand upon that and do everything they need to do to show that through it. But as a script writer, we're not writing that stuff. But I'm not here to teach you how to write scripts. I'm here to teach you how to be a better prose writer. And believe me when I say to you, the thing that separates prose from everything else is that it's the only medium where the reader is inside the narrator. They literally can become that narrator. So if you don't write anything but what a camera can see, you are missing the entire point of being a prose writer because you're missing everything that makes prose so amazingly delicious for a reader, which is everything that's going on inside of that narrating character. However, 
to bring that into what we're talking about here, it means that everything you describe, like that old shack from the last example, what we want to do is we want to make sure that it's always personal to the narrator. So to take this a little bit further, let's look at a few pieces from my own actual writing. So these aren't examples. This is actually me writing prose. And let's discuss this a little bit further. First, let's look at first person. So feel free to read along with me as I read this. It was chilly, even though it was August, and the street was deserted, even though it was about three in the afternoon. Across the road from me sat Cafe Jack's, an ancient rust-covered brick building with a stained red and white striped awning and an eerie wooden statue sitting beside its front door. What the hell was that thing even supposed to be? An Indian? An old white man? A child molester? I really had no idea. Still, the windows promised old-fashioned shakes and malts, as well as awesome burgers and fries. And since I hadn't eaten a thing since early that morning, they had my full attention. So just a little first person piece. You don't need to know anything about the story. This is just an example to kind of show you making things personal. But obviously, everything that we're describing is personal to BOV. The temperature, where she's at, how things are situated based off of where she's standing. It's all personal. But then we get to that weird statue and we get information about that statue based on her, her personality and her quirks. So you can see she's a little bit snarky. More than likely, it's one of the first two. It's either an Indian or it's an old white man. It's kind of a degraded statue. It's been there for 60, 70 years, and it was made of wood, and it, it hasn't fared well sitting out in the weather in front of this restaurant. Obviously, no one is going to make a statue of a child molester, but it kind of shows you her quirky side. It shows you a little bit about her. And then the same thing, when we get down, why is she even looking at this restaurant? Why is this restaurant important of all the other buildings on this street that she's standing in? Well, she hasn't eaten since early that morning. It's afternoon. We've already said that. So it's been a while since she's put food in her belly. And the fact that it has big words on the windows that says, come eat here, we have food, that's what makes it personal to her. That grabs her attention and keeps her interested. And what makes her interested in the world around her is what the reader is going to be interested. Now, obviously, this is a piece way deeper into the story. But if I've done my job as a writer at the beginning of this, then I've already made the reader care about this character. The reader has connected with this character and wants to experience things with this character. So once I have that buy-in from the reader, then as long as I keep the story personal to that narrating character, then the reader is going to constantly be engaged. They're going to be engaged in what this you know, street is, what that statue is, why the windows say what they do. They know that she's hungry. They're going to be you know, excited. I and mean, this is a mundane thing, but they're going to be excited for her to get some food and so on and so forth. So again, it's just about understanding that everything stays personal to the narrator and as long as you've done your job and connected the reader to that narrator, then you'll always connect the reader to what they're reading. And it's not just important in first person. Let's look at a third person limited piece. Again, feel free to read along with me as I read this. Have I sworn my allegiance to the just or simply to the victorious? This question clawed at Valame Dre's mind as he passed his gaze over the imposing group assembled in a loose circle beneath the Temple of Wisdom, ten in total, including himself and Tyle. Can the righteousness of our cause truly cleanse my soul of what I've done this day? He could not say. The bile resting in the back of his throat was less ambiguous. Soot and ash congealed in his sweat, conspiring to irritate the skin beneath his armor. It exasperated the dark clouds saturating his thoughts. Those in attendance stood around a central sending stone and spoke in hushed whispers. Waiting. I hate waiting. So again, third person but we're doing the exact same thing. It's all about Valame Dre and how he sees the world around him. So as long as I do my job and connect my reader to Valamain, then the reader is going to be interested in how Valamain reacts to the world around him. Hard, yes, I understand, but that's what we're doing in our prose writing. We're making sure that we keep everything personal to our narrator because they're the ones telling the story. Not me. Those two pieces that you just read, one with the, the girl who is you know, on that street looking for food. That's not my story. I've never been on that street. That's, a, it's Eureka, Montana. I've never been to Eureka, Montana, but she's standing in the street right now looking for food. It's her story, not mine. Valame is in the underground underneath the Temple of Wisdom. Guess what? I've never been there either. That's his story. He's dealing with this stuff, not me. So we want to make sure that everything we write of them interacting with the world around them is personal to them, not to me. 
Thinking point eight, let your dialogue speak for itself. Dialogue in a novel is not simply your characters talking to each other. It can also be a way for the writer to show more of their story because it gives insight into your characters. Now, I do an entire class just on dialogue. And I truly feel that dialogue is the hardest thing to master as a prose writer and really make it sing. So as the months roll on, I will definitely be hitting this topic pretty hard. But for now, as it relates to showing versus telling, let's look at a couple things. First of all, one of the beautiful things about dialogue is you can use it as a way to eliminate some of your info dumps. So let's say we have a piece of narrative like this. Sally was a 20-year company woman. Drake knew she was frustrated, but he also knew she wouldn't roll over on their boss just for being an idiot. She had a conscience. Well, that's very telly. It's very info dumpy. We're basically just giving a bunch of information about this character to the reader. But if Drake is already there with Sally and they're getting ready to have a conversation, then a lot of what she says could convey all of this information to the reader. So as an example, if there's already a piece of dialogue conversation that's happening between these two characters, we could just slip in. Once again, I had to cover for our imbecile boss. Sally sighed and plopped in her chair. But I couldn't let things go forward his way, Drake. You know it would have cost the company millions. I just wish I could tell the board and not feel guilty about ruining his career. Funny thing is, everything in the narrative above this dialogue is in this dialogue. Everything. There isn't a single piece of information above that isn't below. Now, there is one that you might lock in on. It does say she's a 20-year company woman. And you might go, well, it doesn't say anything about her working there for 20 years. No, it doesn't. For a couple of different reasons. First of all, Sally is a tertiary character that we're going to see in this scene and probably never see again for the rest of the story. But secondly, does the story have anything to do with her being at this company for 20 years? No. So the reader doesn't need that specific piece of information. However... The dialogue does show that she's been at the company for a really long time because it says, I just wish I could tell the board and not feel guilty about ruining his career. Does a new hire secretary have access to the board of directors of a large corporation? No. You have to have been there for a really long time before you have the ear of the board of directors. So by that line, the reader should be able to infer that this person has been with this company for a long time. If it's important to make sure the reader really grasps that, I'm going to add a few more pieces of dialogue where the reader gets that, oh man, Sally's been here for a really, really long time. And there's a plethora of ways to do that. I'm not going to go into it. But let's look at everything else. Is Sally frustrated? Yeah, it says Sally sighed and plopped in her chair. That's me showing frustration. Is she a company woman? Well, she said she wouldn't let it go forward because it would have cost the company millions. If she wasn't a company woman, she wouldn't care about the company losing money. Does she have a conscience? She literally says she would feel guilty if she turned the guy in. So again, one of the things that we can use our dialogue for is we can use them for opportunities of cutting out really crappy telly narration and just work it into these conversations that we're already writing. At least a third of your novel is probably dialogue. Maybe upwards of half of your manuscript is going to be dialogue. So we need to look at that and look for ways of being a more showy writer with our dialogue as opposed to telling. Continuing on with dialogue, thinking point nine, let the reader hear it. Don't tell the reader what they hear. Speech tags can be useful tools for showing rather than telling your story. Unfortunately, many people use them as tells. As an example, let's go, Drake said anxiously. Remember what I said at the beginning of this video, if you can turn it into a math equation, you are telling. Drake said equals anxiously. We don't do math, we do grammar. And to fix this, we're going to do the same thing that we talked about before. We're going to have to ask the question, what does it look like to say something anxiously? Whatever that answer is, that's what you're going to write. So as an example, let's go, Drake said, trying to glance in all directions at once. Now I'm showing that Drake is anxious. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to just use a crappy adverb within the speech tag, the anxiously. Or an even worse example, be quiet, Drake screamed loudly. These kill me. These literally, I die inside every time I read something like this in a manuscript. Come on. There's no way to scream but loudly. Why would you add loudly to screamed? That's insanity. Don't do that. And the biggest reason is, is there's just absolutely no difference between that and be quiet, Drake screamed. The Drake scream loudly doesn't read louder in the reader's head. It just is him screaming, be quiet in both of them. 
Nothing changes for the reader in these sentences other than the fact of having to read a really crappily placed adverb. And speaking of adverbs, thinking point 10, kill your adverbs. I hate adverbs. I really do. They're, they're my least favorite thing about the English language. And the reason is, is because in the above example, we have another common mistake, overusing adverbs. But adverbs are not just found in speech tags. Oh no, my friends, all writers, especially new ones, tend to radically overuse adverbs. Luckily, most adverbs are easily trimmed from your lovingly constructed manuscript. Because many adverbs are simply redundant. They add nothing to sentences, and they're just weak, crappy writing. And I really do believe that you should kill as many of them as you possibly can. Keeping low, Drake quickly raced to the other side of the room. Can you race any other way than quickly? Can you slowly race to the other side of the room? No, you can't. So just writing keeping low Drake race to the other side of the room doesn't change anything. It absolutely doesn't. When the plane tilted sideways, Drake was thrown completely out the open door. Oh, thank you so much for making sure that you didn't make that ambiguous because I was terrified that Drake had left his leg in the plane when he left. No, that's, that's not what happened. And it's stupid. Instead, when the plane tilted sideways, Drake was thrown out the open door. Because we're going to know that he was completely thrown out the open door. We get that. We're not worried about his leg hanging around after he's gone. As with everything, I'm not saying don't use adverbs. If you don't use any adverbs in your writing, it will not be good. As with all aspects, writing is a balancing act. Don't cut out all your filtering, just cut out the ones that don't need to be there. And when it comes to adverbs, for the most part, adverbs are just crappy writing. And not just in the, the annoying ways that I showed you in those last couple of examples. Like we could write the line, Drake slowly walked across the room. But who gives a crap? If we're really going to be a dynamic writer, we might write something like dragging his feet. Drake dreaded what he would find on the other side of the room. Now I'm engaged as a reader. Now I'm immersed. Now I want to know what's on the other side. Of the room. Or maybe I don't want to know. Wait, maybe you don't want to go to the other side of the room. Like it's just, it's so much better to write without adverbs for the most part. But the reality is, is I probably use an adverb every page or two, maybe every three pages, there'll be an adverb. Heck, sometimes I go crazy and there'll be two adverbs on the same page. That's fine. It's not about cutting every single one. I mean, sometimes the door just slowly closes and it's perfectly fine to write that. Where the problem comes in is when writers do not pay attention to them at all. And you will notice that there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of adverbs, you know, three or four in every paragraph, sometimes three or four in every sentence. And that gets ridiculous. And the worst are the ones that are just redundant, like racing quickly or, you know, shouting loudly and all that crap. Those are just terrible things that should not be in your manuscript. That's just poor writing is what that is. But don't think this applies just to adverbs either, because it absolutely affects adjectives as well. So we might write the line, knowing the boy was exceptionally smart, Drake expected no less of him. But just like we talked about your verbs being strong, really what we're doing here is we're using exceptionally to strengthen the word smart, because smart is a weak word. So be careful with this with your adjectives. First of all, you don't want to pile up adjectives upon adjectives upon adjectives because those become tiresome to read and usually hurt the immersion of the story. But it really goes back to what we talked about, about using stronger verbs. You should use stronger words any chance you can. So instead of using this adjective to strengthen the word smart, instead we could write, knowing the boy was brilliant, Drake expected no less of him. Now we don't need exceptionally brilliant because brilliant is much stronger than the word smart, and it doesn't need another adjective to make it stronger. Look, it all comes down to time and effort. I say this in every one of my classes. We as prose writers are making stuff up. It's fiction. And yet we expect people to pay us money for this. If you expect to get paid for your work, then whoever's paying you for that work should expect that you've put in some time and effort to make it at a professional level. And I don't think that's an insane expectation for them to have. And if you're very adverb heavy or adjective heavy, using you know weak words throughout your writing, telling instead of showing, these are all things that I'm not going to pay you for. I'm not going to pay you to be a bad writer and tell me a bad story. Time and effort. It's what we do as professional writers. We create professional level of stories that are engaging and entertaining and immersive. That being said, it's okay to tell sometimes. 
It just depends on what you're doing. As I've said throughout this, writing is a balancing act. It is not about doing all of one thing or all of another thing because you can't. That'll ruin your writing. And sometimes you just need to tell. Usually it's for events that the reader has already experienced. So as an example, maybe a character is telling another character something that's already happened. So we used, if you remember back at the very beginning of this, we had a couple examples where there was a monster attacking Drake. Well, if we're going to write the chapter where this monster attacks Drake and Drake has to deal with it and escape and, you know, narrowly gets away with his life. Well, if in the next chapter he goes home and he's talking to his wife and he's like, oh my God, honey, you'll never believe this. This I was at the park and I was doing it and I got attacked by a monster, a real live claw bearing monster. Well, we don't want to sit there as Drake actually verbatim says everything that he went through because we were there. We're the readers and we were there in that chapter. So just, you know, write the line. And then Drake told his wife about the monster attack because we've experienced it already and we're good with that. Or what I see more than that is transitions. A lot of writers have problems transitioning from one scene to another where there's something in between. So like, let's say we have a scene in New York and then we know our characters are going to take a train to Chicago where there's going to be another scene in Chicago. Well, if nothing happens on the train ride, don't write it. Don't write a chapter where they go down to the train station and stand in line and buy their ticket. And then they stand in line to get onto the train. And then they get onto the train and they find a place for their baggage. And then they find their car and they look out the window as the trees are going by. And then they pick what they want to eat for lunch off the menu. And then they eat their lunch. And then they chit chat about nothing. And then they look out the window some more. Like, don't write that crap if nothing happens. Yeah, we need to make sure that the readers understand that we started in New York and we're going to now continue in Chicago. But that's easily solved by a simple simple little line of, and then Drake boarded a train for Chicago. The next afternoon, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you just transition through it quickly. And that's a tell. It's absolutely a tell, but it's a tell your readers want to read as opposed to a chapter of nothing while your character is traveling on this train where nothing happens to them. So yeah, a lot. There's a lot to keep in mind. And, and again, showing is more of a changing in how you think about what your job is as a prose writer than anything else. Because the words at your disposal don't change. Use the same words to tell as you used to show. The difference comes from your understanding how you're going to use those words. And hopefully that's helped you out. As always, you can find me on social media, Max Alexander Drake on Facebook or Max A. Drake on Twitter. But really, you should be utilizing the private Facebook group, which is at Facebook slash group slash Brutal Writing Advice. Now get in there and start being a more showy writer. Until next time. Hey everyone, Drake here. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you got something out of this little tutorial of mine. If you'd like to continue learning uh, from me and, and how I see writing and everything else, this video that you just watched is just a small piece of my Better Writing Through Stronger Narrative book. You can also check out my book, Dynamic Story Creation in Plain English. I've heard that both are really, really good. You can find them both at Amazon.com or on my website, DrakeU.com. If you'd like to check out what I've been working on during this crazy time, you can head on over to fiendfolly.com and check out some stuff, some artwork that I've done on a new cartoon that I'm working on. There's some videos up as well. So hopefully you'll go over to fiendfolly.com and check that out and stay safe. Thank you.